Hey, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to another Graphs and Matroids seminar. Today we have Sebastian uh, speaking about even circuits in oriented matroids. Go ahead. All right. Hello, everybody, and uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, just a little heads up, a little disclaimer before we start. So I'm not exactly a matroid person. This was kind of a, a side adventure we made. Um, and because of that, I'm not super familiar with, with all the matroid stuff. And not to embarrass myself, I stuck to graphs in most of the talk, and I will only uh, talk a little bit about the, the matroidal uh, versions of our results at the very end. And maybe because everything was new for me, I felt the need to uh, also include all of the technical definitions and stuff like that. So if that's too, too basic for you, I, I apologize in advance. <laughs> so let's get started. Um, and to, to start, I want to properly motivate uh, our little journey here. And to do this, uh, we start with Pfeffian orientations and non-even digraphs. So this is where the graphic version of the um, directed even circuit problem comes from. So um, Pfeffian orientation is an orientation of a graph G, such that for every matching, every perfect matching that is uh, of our uh, graph, Every m alternating cycle, that is, each the edges are alternatingly inside of m and outside of m, um, is oddly oriented. And oddly oriented just means if I take my cycle, it has an odd number of edges going in one direction around the cycle and an odd number in the other direction. Um, this has several quantifiers here, and here's an every, and here's another every that would be horrible to check, uh, even on a small graph like this. But luckily, we found out it's, it suffices to make it for one perfect matching. Still horrible to check, but on small graphs like this one, maybe a little bit more comprehensive uh, for you guys. So uh, I have my small um, example graph here, and I put on some perfect matching. It shows this one to make it a bit interesting. And uh, I also gave it already a Pfeffian orientation. So if you want to check, maybe for this alternating cycle here, for example, you will see it has three directed edges going in one direction and exactly one going the other way, so odd in both directions. So this is the, the idea of Pfeffian orientations, and they turn out to be pretty useful. They um, were, for example, used by, by Castellain, who's uh, actually a physicist, to solve the so-called Daimler problem, which eventually boils down to uh, solving things like max cut and, in particular, computing the number of perfect matchings of a graph. Um, so this is kind of a big thing in, in matching theory. <clears throat> but it also has some, some nice translations into the setting of directed graphs. And the next few parts, I will try to explain to you how. So um, just a little side mark uh, on the top right of the slide. I can take my cube here, so that's the cube, and draw it slightly different. I draw it as you might usually draw a bipedal graph with one partition on the bottom here, that's the white vertices, and then the, the black vertices on the top. And I also chose my, my Pfeffian orientation such that all of the matching edges are oriented from white to black, and then the others are kind of um, chaotic here. But because every M alternating cycle has an odd number of edges in both directions, uh, and uh, the red edges all go up, and going up and then down means I have exactly an odd number of uh, edges going from white to black in every one of my uh, M alternating cycles. This we will come back to in a moment. So the next thing we want to do is we want to kind of go into the world of digraphs. And to do this, we fix our perfect matching here in our graph. And we do two operations. The first operation is we take each non-matching edge and we assign it an orientation from black to white. So in this case here, that's the correct orientation. And in this case on top here, that's exactly the opposite orientation. And the second uh, um, operation we do is we contract all of the matching edges into single vertices. So here is what happens. So each matching edge now is a vertex. And each non-matching edge of my uh, bipartite graph now has become a directed edge going from black to white. And you can see, for example, that the 
this M alternating cycle here has now been translated into a directed cycle. So that's a very nice property of this operation. It allows me to construct from a bipartite graph of perfect matching a digraph. And also, once I have fixed uh, the, the orientation, say from black to white, I can also reconstruct the bipartite graph uniquely from my digraph. So this is reversible. Now back to my comment from before. Um, on the top right corner here, uh, we have seen that there is an odd number of edges going from white to black. And these are exactly the edges which do not correspond with uh, the assignment of direction I used to construct my graph. So what happens if I now take every edge in here um, that uh, whose direction coincides with the direction assigned uh, by the Pfeffian orientation here, and I subdivide it by a single vertex like this. It means I have an odd number of non-subdivided edges in each directed cycle and some number of once subdivided uh, edges. And now if I look at any directed cycle, we will see because each subdivided edge contributes an even number of edges to the length of the cycle and I have an odd number of non-subdivided edges, every directed cycle now has become odd. So that's a, a very interesting property. And it gives rise to a whole class of graphs called the non-even digraphs. Oh yeah, so this is what we just saw. Um, so I will call a, no, a digraph non-even if I am able to find some subdivision of its, edge, its, its edges such that all of the even directed cycles are gone. Every directed cycle is of odd length. And this is just one of the, the versions of the um, Pfeffian recognition problem for uh, bipartite graphs at least. So a digraph D is non-even if and only if the corresponding bipartite graph like this guy here has a Pfeffian orientation. So these two things are interchangeable. This is the, the whole thing started. And then we come to, to the actual motivation behind the talk or our research, the even directed cycle problem. So given some digraph, you subdivide some edges, and now you want to know, uh, is this a good subdivision? So did I get rid of all the uh, even directed cycles? To test this, of course, you would need to be able to check for the existence of an even die cycle in your digraph. Um, and it turns out this is more or less uh, the same thing. So these two problems, deciding whether there exists a subdivision such that all of the um, even directed cycles are gone, and uh, whether there is at least one even directed cycle, these are polynomial time equivalents. So there's no real uh, difference between these two problems. And here's something we noticed when we went through the proof, uh, namely that uh, the one by Seymour and Thomason here uses almost exclusively arguments from the cycle space. And this is what got us started because we thought, okay, if it's just in the cycle space, then maybe we can do something more general here. Um, for those of you more familiar than I am with Matroids, this might already be like the, the one pointer to, towards what's coming next. So that's the even die cycle problem, deciding whether there is an even direct cycle. Um, to make this a bit more comprehensible in, <coughs> for, for the study of Matroids, we need to get rid of the idea of subdivisions. And so we want to reformulate uh, what non-even digraph means. So um, I can do the following thing. So D now is a non-even digraph and D prime is some subdivision where all of the even directed cycles have disappeared. And now I can partition the edges of D into two sets. One of them, even of D prime, are those edges of D which are subdivided an even number of times and odd of D prime are those edges which have been subdivided an odd number of times. And just to, to add more to, con to confusion, things that have been subdivided an odd number of times contribute an even number to the length, and things in the even set contribute an odd number to the length. Why, why make everything nice and clear? Uh, ah, yeah, I also wrote this down. So um, let's, let's make some small observations. And the first one is, uh, since I'm only interested in parity, uh, it's probably enough to say I have edges which are not subdivided or subdivided exactly once. 
just to, to make pictures a bit uh, easier to understand. Um, and then the second observation is um, looking at this set even, so the guys that, that uh, contribute uh, an odd number to the length of every cycle, and these actually form a so-called feedback arc set. So they intersect every directed cycle. And not only do they do intersect every, every directed cycle, they intersect every directed cycle in an odd number of elements. So they form kind of an odd feedback arc set. And uh, it turns out, if I have an odd feedback arc set and just subdivide its complement, then, of course, all of my uh, directed cycles still become odd. So I can just use this, uh, the existence of such an odd feedback arc set as the definition of being non-even. So from now on, if I say non-even digraph, I mean there is a set of edges which intersects every direct cycle in an odd number of things. And that's much nicer because now I just talk about two objects, cycles and uh, edges. So the next thing I want to have is I want to know what, what does the dual version seen from planarity look like. So here's some digraph. Uh, spoiler alert, this thing here has uh, an odd feedback arc set. And I want to create the planar dual of this. So how do I create a planar dual of my digraph? Um, the first step is, as in undirected graphs, I just draw it in the plane, and I put um, a vertex in every face. And now any two faces that share an edge will be joined by an edge. But I have to make the dual a digraph again. So I need to fix some rule. And the rule is simply, um, I fix some direction, in this case, clockwise. And every edge it, between two faces is just rotated clockwise um, until it connects the two corresponding vertices. And thereby, I get something. This, this, this particular construction has a nice property that whenever I have a directed cycle that bounds a face, or even does not bound the face, then this directed cycle is transformed by the planar dual into a directed bond, meaning a cut, so a bipartition of the vertex set, such that each side of the cut induces a weakly connected subgraph. And also all of the edges go only from one side of the bipartition into the other. So there's no edges in both directions like this one. So here's the complete dual of my thing. Um, and here, as I said, there, of course, is an odd feedback arc set in uh, this graph. It's the blue edges here. And each of these blue edges crosses exactly one of the uh, pink edges. So if I now look at these crossed edges, again, four, I observe that now I got a set of um, directed edges that intersects every die bond, so every directed cut where both sides are connected. And it, or not only does it intersect every die bond, it intersects every die bond in an odd number of elements. So this is what we call an odd die join. And now we know for planar digraphs, at least, um, a planar digraph has an odd die join if and only if its planar dual uh, is a non-even digraph. So we already solved part of our problem. Uh, namely asking when does an odd die join exist. And this part is fairly easy. Um, the more complicated part comes when we allow for non-planarity. So under what circumstances does a non-planar digraph have an odd die join? So this will be the next part of our journey to investigate. Um, as it turns out, uh, this is actually a question about minors and structural graph theory. And to, to properly describe what comes next, I need to introduce the idea of butterfly minors in digraphs. So here, my, my third picture on the bottom here, if you would allow to, for any edge in a digraph to be contracted, the contraction might um, create a new directed cycles that weren't there before. So suppose I have this edge and there's a directed path that joins into this edge and joins these two vertices. This guy, of course, does not create a directed cycle with the red edge here, but after the contraction, it would. So um, this is what we want to avoid because we, we are interested in the study of the directed cycles in our graph. So this is the forbidden part. And that means uh, the only edges we are allowed to contract are those which either are the only outgoing edge of some vertex 
or the only incoming edge of some vertex. Whenever an edge fulfills this requirement, we call it contractible. Um, and this contractability has the very nice um, property that it preserves the existence um, of an uh, odd feedback arc set. So suppose F is an odd feedback arc set of some digraph and say this edge UV here is contractible. Then in my first case here, it's not part of the set F. Um, so if I contract it, uh, I have shortened every directed cycle by one. But uh, because uh, it's not part of F in the subdivision definition of non-even, I would have subdivided it. So it would have contributed an even uh, number to the length of every directed cycle. After contracting it, it's gone. But I just have removed an even number of edges from every directed cycle that go through it. So I'm still fine. F still is an odd feedback accent. Um, the other case would be if F belongs to, uh, if UV belongs to F. And in this case, I just have to flip something. So now in, in this example here, uh, UV is the only outcoming edge of U. So I have some white guys that uh, contribute an even number of edges. Um, together with the green edge, they contribute an odd number. So this I have to maintain. Therefore, they will be fed into the set F because every directed cycle going through this edge must go through, through UV. And similarly, if I have two uh, consecutive green guys together, they contribute an even number. So if I just move this guy out of F, make it white here, um, I have maintained the property. And now I get a set F prime, which still is an odd feedback accent. So because the, we are closed under these butterfly contractions means we can find uh, a set of minimal obstructions with respect to this operation. And actually, um, this was already done by Seymour and Thomason, also in uh, 87. And it was the first, at least to my knowledge, the first paper that used the at least the idea of butterfly miners. So I think they don't use the name yet, but that was like the first um, paper that introduced the idea of cycle preserving contractions in digraphs. Uh, also, of course, when I say minor, I say I am allowed to contract contractible edges takes and take subgraphs. So delete vertices and edges as you like. And the set of uh, obstructions they found were actually essentially the odd undirected cycles, um, which is kind of a weird thing. So you're non-even if and only if you exclude all odd uh, undirected cycles as butterfly minus. Here are some examples. So when I say undirected, I just say, I just mean take the undirected graph and replace every edge by the two uh, uh, corresponding directed edges. So that's a very nice structural um, description. And this is kind of the flavor of uh, our result as well. Um, but again, the definition of butterfly minus uses vertices, right? It says it's the edge is only the either outgoing or the, the only incoming edge um, at a vertex. And that's not suitable for something in matrix where we don't really want to talk about vertices. So let's do a slight uh, generalization. Suppose I have um, some bond in my diagram, so some cut, not necessarily directed, actually not directed at all. Um, then I call an edge bond contractible if the removal of this edge E here would turn this bond into a dye bond. So essentially, if this edge is the only edge going the other way. <clears throat> um, the idea of butterfly minus in the first place was that uh, contracting contractible edges does not create new directed cycles. So if this now is our generalized version, we have to make sure that um, uh, it kind of, first of all, it works well with butterfly minus. That's my, my part here. Um, so from the butterfly minor definition from before, you can see if an edge is butterfly contractible, it's definitely also uh, bond contractible because just the bond around the sooner vertex works. And it's the only outgoing guy. Um, and the second thing is uh, we, do not want to create new directed cycles. So suppose we would do so. 
So here's my, my thing. That's my bond that kind of um, certifies uh, that my edge is uh, contractible. And suppose there is a directed cycle after I contract it. That would mean that there is a directed path that's kind of in parallel to my edge. It starts at the uh, tail of the edge, goes somewhere, and finally ends at the head of my edge. Now, if I contract E, I get a directed cycle. Um, but because it joins the tail to the head, at some point, it has to walk through the bond exactly in the same direction as E does. And that would uh, contradict uh, our definition from before. So everything is fine. Um, and with the same arguments as before, we can say that the class of non even digraphs is also closed under contracting bond contractible edges. And then we can use this to define a slightly generalized version of butterfly minus and get the exact same result as Simon Thomason for digraphs. But now with something that doesn't talk about vertices, is very nice. So now finally, <laughs> we have all of the ingredients together and we can start talking about what happens in the dual. And that's the actual novel part of um, our research, something we call cut minus. Um, we already found the, uh, the three operations of our generalized butterfly minor operations, which were vertex deletion, edge deletion, and contracting bond contractible edges. Contra deleting vertices, I, I kind of see it as forgetting components, so weakly connecting components. Uh, deleting an edge might be the same thing as contracting an edge in the um, planar dual. And finally, um, Contracting bond, contractible edges need some more discussion. So here's my discussion. Uh, before, we said an edge is bond contractible if there exists a, die bo a bond, which is not a die bond, but if I remove the edge, it becomes a die bond. Um, dually speaking, I could say an edge is removable if there exists a cycle C, which is not a directed cycle, but if I contract the edge E, it becomes a direct itself. So it's just the same thing. I just replace deletion by um, contraction and bond by cycle. And um, the nice uh, property of this is if I remove a removable edge, then I do not create new die bonds. So this allows me now to, to make some structural um, claims about uh, the structure of die bonds in my die graph. And this will be our dual operation to contracting bond contractible edges. And similar to before, we can now prove that uh, a digraph has an odd die join. Um, if a digraph has an odd die join, then every cut minor of D also has an odd die join because the existence of these things are preserved. We don't introduce new uh, die bonds is essentially the, the important part here. Okay, so that's cut minus. Um, and now we want to characterize all of the digraphs that admit or die joints in terms of forbidden cut minus, so finding minimal obstructions. And one set of such uh, obstructions is already known, comes from the planar case, namely the planar duals or of all of these odd um, uh, bidirected cycles here. So what we do is we um, take them and we make some, some observation on their structure. So for each of these digons, these directed cycles of length two, I get a vertex and none of these digon vertices will be adjacent. So they kind of form one of the two color classes of the bipedal graph. And then what I also get are uh, two vertices in another color class, um, which represent the inner and the outer phase of uh, these um, undirected cycles. So if I draw it a little bit differently, uh, in this case, I will have two guys in one color class and an odd number of guys in the other, co other color class. And then in particular, the, the way I drew these cycles here, um, all of the edges go from one of the two classes to the other. Um, and I can kind of generalize this. So here is something we call an odd one direction. Odd means the total number of vertices is odd. Um, and one direction means it's just a complete bipedal graph and all of the edges go from one color class to the other. And as I said before, uh, these guys here are essentially the special case where I think N in my picture 
equals to two, and then m has to be odd, which is taken care of by these guys being odd cycles. But as you can see, if I pump this up to, to contain more vertices than two in each of the classes, uh, I leave the, the um, playing field of planarity, because suddenly I get k33 in there. And so I find things that did not appear in the primal study of uh, butterfly miners. And this will be the, the theorem, the main theorem of, of our research, that the die graph has an odd die join, if and only if it does not contain an odd one direction where both sides have at least two vertices, uh, or the dual of an odd bicycle as a cut mine. And this or here just comes from the fact that I have drawn these guys nicely, but of course, uh, nobody prevents me from drawing this edge in the other direction and then going here. And by doing so, I kind of break the, the property of being an odd one direction, but they, they don't really differ. It just makes the statement a bit more ugly, but otherwise it's the same thing. And in the matroidal setting, as you will see later, there is no difference at all. These, these special cases just vanish. So how do we prove this? So here's some, some math for you if you want. Um, more or less, we, we follow the, the basic idea of uh, the original proof by uh, uh, Seymour and Thomason. But of course, since we are in a different setting, different things will happen. But uh, the overall idea is just to take a minimal obstruction um, and beat at it with everything we have to figure out how, what it looks like. So the first thing we might be able to observe is suppose there is a vertex whose deletion completely destroys the weak connectivity of my, um, my graph D. And in this case, because D is a minimal obstruction, D1 and D2 are not, so D1 and D2 will have an odd die join. I will find these odd die joins, and um, because they were just joined by a vertex and nothing else, I can combine them, get an odd die join for the whole graph. Um, hence, my uh, minimal obstruction will be vertex two connected. Next thing I could observe is, suppose I have a directed cycle C um, in D, then contract it to a vertex, uh, and observe that uh, if I have a directed, oh, that was too fast. Suppose I have a directed cycle, no die bond will go through the cycle, meaning all of the die bonds uh, of the graph are contracted the cycle will still be the same as before. Um, so if I find, because of millimeter, I will find an odd die join here. Hence, I will find an odd die join in the original graph. And again, contradiction. So I will also assume that my guys are acyclic. There is no directed cycle at all. Um, similarly, uh, suppose I have a removable edge, so an edge with a parallel path. Um, then I can remove the edge, make the same argument as before. I have not created new die bonds. I have not destroyed old ones. Um, so I will find an odd die join in the removed part, and I may also uh, assume that I'm transitively reduced, so no edge has a parallel path to it. And then here comes a, a more technical lemma. But I find the lemma nice, but I will not explain where it comes from. Um, so the lemma essentially says that if you find an uh, edge set whose contraction produces an acyclic uh, digraph and which induces an oriented forest, um, then there will exist a die bond in D that contains the, the entire set, uh, which is just a nice observation. It took us a while to find. Um, still, it's relatively similar to something that happens in the original proof. And using this observation with some more arguments represented by these magical stars here, uh, allows us to make a very nice assumption on the, the overall structure, namely that uh, all of these minimal obstructions, these D must have the structure that they're essentially three independent sets layered like that. And we only have edges from V1 to V2, from V2 to V3, and no jump from V1 to V3. So that's the first part we get. And you can see we're already almost uh, in the realm of odd one directions. There's just for some reason, a third layer. And this we, we need to, to get rid of in the next slide. Um, so let's do some case analysis. That's, that's the most fun part of every proof, right? So um, let's dive right in. 
Um, let us assume uh, V2 contains exactly one vertex. Then deleting it cuts uh, the graph in many, many pieces. So uh, that can't happen. Hence, we may assume that we have at least two guys. Suppose it's exactly two, like that. Um, then we essentially have two cases. The first case would be that um, V3 and V1 both together have an even number of vertices. But in this case, uh, we can see essentially these guys represent two faces. Um, and the other guys kind of faces of cycles of length two, right? The, all of them are of degree two. So I can draw the primal graph like this. The guys below will be represented by um, uh, cycles going in one particular direction. In this case, the outer edge goes uh, counterclockwise. And the guys above are exactly this, the opposite. So the edge outside will go clockwise. Of each of these types, I get as many as I have vertices in the corresponding class. And what I get is an even undirected cycle now. Even undirected cycles do not contain odd undirected cycles as butterfly minors. Maybe a weird statement, but that's definitely true. And more importantly, uh, they contain uh, an odd feedback arc set because they do, um, our supposed obstruction has an odd die join. That's of course impossible. So this case is, is fine, can't happen. So the next case would be if uh, V1 and V3 together have an odd number of vertices, but doing the same idea of the construction, I arrive at an odd bicycle and we already know these are indeed minimal obstructions. So here we are fine. So from now on, we may assume that V2 contains at least three guys. And then let's do some more cases. For example, suppose uh, V1 and V3 both are odd. Um, in this case, we will be, we are sure that we can find something called a T-joint for V1 and V3. So a T-joint for those who don't know is uh, a set of edges um, such that the graph induced exactly by these edges has uh, the property that every vertex inside of T has an odd degree and every vertex outside of T has an even degree. Um, and the nice thing about this structure is uh, it's, di it's bonds are relatively easy to check. So every vertex of V1 defines a bond. Similarly, every vertex of V3, no vertex in V2 can define a die bond. So these are uninteresting for us. And then the remaining things are possibilities where we contain some vertices of V1 plus some vertices of V2, for example, or maybe a bit more. Um, but you can also uh, observe if I do not contain everything of V1, just something of V2, then I will have an edge leaving the bond, so going in one direction, but also an edge going the other direction. So this does not define a die bond. Um, similarly, from above, of course, so here the same thing happens. And also if I go like this, for example, also not a die bond. Um, and this says that the only bonds except for the, uh, the only die bonds except for the trivial ones are those that either contain all of V1 and something of V2. So something like that, for example, or from the top this. And now it becomes apparent because um, the edge set we found was a T join each of these die bonds will contain a non number of edges. So we indeed found an odd die join. Um, we can go into more detail here, but uh, the next case where V2 contains more than three guys um, is more complicated, needs more, uh, more effort. And so I will just not talk about it and continue. Um, so suppose we are done with case four, which is just, just more case analysis, some more involved uh, arguments. Um, we may assume that uh, one of the two classes, so V3 or V1 is empty. I chose V3 to be empty. And now all that's left is to analyze what happens if the total number of vertices is even, because if the total number of vertices is odd, we have found our, um, uh, our odd one direction. So one case could, for example, be um, the case where both of them are even. And in this case, what I do is I select one vertex from the top, 
which sees everybody except one guy from the bottom. And then the last guy from the bottom sees everybody else on top. And by the discussion of the die bonds from before, this indeed is an odd die join. And the next case would be what happens if both sides are odd. And we can do essentially uh, the same construction, just a little bit different. So I take one guy from the top that sees everybody on the bottom, and then one guy on the bottom that sees everybody on top. So now everybody except these two guys has exactly one incident edge. Each of these guys has an odd number of incident edges. So it's again an odd die um, My co-author Raphael uh, flipped through the slides and told me you, you can skip this step and just tell them that uh, here again, we find a T-join, which of course is also true, but I like this because I can give you the odd die join by hand and not just holistically call for, for some, some uh, result. So what's left is just the case where uh, V1 and V2 have different parities. And in this case, uh, we find an odd one direction. So this completes our proof or at least the part of the proof where we show that the minimal obstruction must indeed be these guys. Um, there's also a way to show that these guys do not have um, an uh, odd die join, but I, I will spare you from this part. And instead move on to oriented matroids. <laughs> so this is for me the, the most, most painful slide because it just contains the definition. So an oriented matroid is a set E, which is the ground set, and a family of subsets of E, um, which are signed. So signed means indeed the things in C are not sets, but tuples of sets, which are disjoint, uh, and each part of this, uh, the tuple is uh, a subset of E. And these will be called the signed circuits. Um, and then there's a couple of axioms I have to to obey. So first of all, um, the thing where both uh, guys are empty is not a signed circuit. And second, um, if C plus C minus is a signed circuit, then uh, it's a metric thing. So C, was, C minus C plus is also a signed circuit. Um, I also have uh, this. Is this already the Young Crossing argument? Nope. Let me quickly remember what this did. Uh, ah, yes. So no circuit, no set of edges that defines a signed circuit can contain a smaller signed circuit on the same edge set. Kind of makes sense. It's the same thing as cycles in graphs. And then finally, sim so because I'm not a Metroid guy, I always explain stuff with cycles and graphs. Uh, the, the last part is kind of an uncrossing property I want to have, um, meaning if I have two signed circuits here represented by um, cycles in a digraph that share an edge, then removing the edge and taking what's left of uh, my, um, my two circuits should again be a circuit. Um, just to, to have this, this nice uncrossing property of cycles in graphs as well. And finally, I will call a circuit directed if one of its two partition sets is empty. So if all of the edges agree on a sign. And then of course I can have signed co-circuits um, and it's just uh, defined very, very similarly. So um, it's again a tuple uh, where um, the two sides of the tuple have to be uh, disjoint. Uh, I may not have the tuple with empty set on both sides. And finally, I need some kind of orthogonality property uh, with regards to um, the signed circuits. So um, if S plus intersects the plus part of some signed circuit and S minus uh, intersects the minus part of some signed circuit, then it, uh, the, the plus part should also intersect the minus part and the minus part should also intersect the plus part. And this is an if and only if. And then again, as for the, the circuits, I will ca uh, call a co-circuit directed if um, one of its two sides is empty, all of the edges agree on one sign. So you can think of this as being a die bond, essentially. So a directed co-circuit will, for me, be usually a die bond. And 
similarly to before. So before we did kind of the exercise, we looked at uh, digraphs with butterfly miners found an obstruction set. We looked at um, digraphs for odd die joints and cut miners found an obstruction set to the existence of an odd die join. Um, and both of these relied on the minor operation. So we need an appropriate operation for oriented matroids, which now we just call butterfly miners. And here are the uh, operations we are allowed to do. So first of all, we are allowed to delete elements. Um, and also we are allowed to contract elements. Um, but great, <laughs> if, if we just allow to contract elements uh, as ever we like, then we might introduce new direct circuits, which of course we don't want. So we again introduce the notion of uh, contractability and say um, an uh, element is contractible if there ex exists a core circuit of our oriented metroid such that uh, the minus side exclusively consists of the edgy. Just minus, I chose this arbitrarily because of this symmetry thing. It could also be that E is the only thing in S plus, but uh, it suffices to, to state it like that. Um, and then I can give you a nice definition of what a butterfly minor of an oriented matroid is. So I allow contraction of contractible elements and deletion of whatever you don't want to have. And then we can move on, go one step further and uh, define non-even oriented matroids. And the definition here only is for regular matroids because as soon as we went beyond that, uh, some, some strange things started to happen. <clears throat> also, there's some, some weirdness with uh, complexity, which you're probably more familiar with than I am. Um, so we say uh, a regular oriented matroid is non-even if there exists a subset of its element such that every directed circuit is met in an odd number of elements. And then from the theorem of Seymour and Thomason, uh, we get that an oriented graphic matroid, so the matroid defined by the, uh, the circuits of a digraph, um, is non-even if and only if we do not contain the um, corresponding oriented matroids obtained by uh, the odd undirected cycles as butterfly minors. And no, oh, what did I put here? Ah, okay. So this just explains again what I just said. So graphic here means I take the edges of my digraph as the elements and the circuits are the cycles. And I just obtain the signing from whether the edges go left or right. And then from what we did before, uh, we also get um, a similar state statement for bond matroids. Let's see whether this happens as well. Yes. Um, so bond matroids means now my circuits are the, the bonds, uh, the directed uh, circuits are the die bonds, and still the elements are my edges. And an oriented bond matroid is non-even if and only if it does not contain the um, corresponding uh, oriented matroid of, of an odd one direction. And in this case, because the um, the duals of the uh, the planar duals of the odd undirected cycles all behave the same way here. Um, we just get rid of them. It's just odd one directions at this point. So in the Metroid setting, we, we can state this a bit nicer. And then <clears throat> it remains to ask, so, so nice, you, you got a, a structural characterization of um, non-even oriented Metroids. Um, can you check whether an or a regular matroid is non-even or let's say a bond matroid is non-even? Um, at least we can say checking whether some regular matroid is non-even is polynomial time equivalent to checking whether there is a um, directed circuit uh, of even length in there. Um, this kind of uses the same arguments as the result by Seymour and Thomason, just on a more abstract level, but not really actually because their, their arguments were already very abstract. Um, but it's of course not a, not a real answer to the question. Um, and to, to be quite frank, we, we don't have one. Uh, we found out that if you try to, to give some, some complexity answer to this, 
using an oracle that gives you the, the circuits, then you will need an exponential number of calls to the to the oracle. So it probably, if there is an answer to this, it probably heavily depends on the way you encode your matroid. Um, but we we don't know any further. So actually, I'm faster than I thought. Um, let's talk about some open problems in the end. So for gray effect matroids, we have seen that uh, Seymour and Thomason already kind of solved the problem with the uh, odd bicycles. So in the matroidal setting, uh, that's that's our result. And for bond matroids, um, we solved the same problem so that the structural characterization using these odd one directions and the more general idea of cut minus. And then there is a very nice uh, result by uh, Seymour who says you can get actually all regular matroids by using some kind of some operations using the graphite matroids, the bond matroids, and uh, this particular guy right here. Um, and if you assign some signings to these um, to these guys, you can see that you also get all oriented matroids the same way. Um, we have checked the oriented matroids that arise from R10 by uh, uh, using a computer. And all of these guys either have an odd die joint or contain um, an odd one direction as a, uh, as a butterfly minor. Um, but we still weren't able to lift this to all regular matrix. So this would be the next natural next step. And we actually conjecture that um, the odd one directions are indeed the only obstructions. So we think after being done with this, there will nothing, nothing more will appear from here. Or if let's let, let's be let's be a bit more generous. If something appears, I think it will be just a sporadic thing, like one or two very special guys. Um, but so far, uh, the sum operations don't really go well with uh, the way um, directed circuits function, and thus we weren't able to, to go further. And then my last question, of course, is what, what even is the complexity of the even directed circuit problem on oriented ma regular matrix? So can we decide whether someone has a directed circuit of even length or not in polynomial time? And that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so let's uh, do a round of applause. If everyone can unmute yourself, and then I'll count to three, and then we'll clap. Um, one, two, three, clap. Awesome. OK, uh, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. So uh, what exactly is the problem? Like, why the, were you just looking at regular matroids? You said that there was a, I'm wondering if it's a problem with the minor operations being sensible or if there's. The, the second you said this, uh, I regretted having made my comment. Uh, it, it's, so I'm sorry, it's, it was a while ago when we, when we made, did this. Um, I think it had something to do with, this, with the, these Oracle calls. So we just couldn't figure out how we would even decide um, very basic properties. I'm, I'm not sure that I can give you a satisfying answer right now. Okay. Sorry. Well, thank you. That's all right. I'm wondering if uh, for the dual problem, uh, the dual graphic, if your mm -hmm. characterization does give this algorithm that you were asking about at the end. Um, there is some, so I think no. And the reason why I think no is because in the uh, primal version, the characterization also didn't give the, the algorithm. The algorithm was later given by, oh. the, by another structural characterization of bipartite okay. fashion graphs. And it okay. took almost 15 years to find this. Thank you. Yeah, I was actually going to ask about that. Do you think there might be a nice structural characterization? That, or do you know of natural classes for the dual graphic case? Um, so I am not entirely sure. I, I like to think that there, again, is, is a nice structural characterization. 
and I would so so my my personal uh, thought about this is that it's similar to the to the primal case that you essentially take a, a specialized specialized version of um, planar uh, acyclic digraphs and then have some sort of some operation that glues them together. Maybe you find one one particular sporadic example outside of this. And so I would expect something like that help, to happen, but it turned out to be even harder to work with dye bonds than with directed cycles. So we, we didn't venture into this too much. Well, I guess since you have these obstructions that are like uh, almost like complete bipartite graphs, but with special conditions, I mean, you must also get dense things coming up. But... Yes, probably. Yeah, especially since we are not allowed to delete um, to delete edges, so this might actually be true. Um, but maybe the dense things possible. are really dense or something like that, so they can somehow be like have nice structure. But it's I think it it looks like it's going to be reasonably complicated as soon as you get away. From yes, <laughs> I, I I would could imagine that the dense parts are essentially strongly connected, so you could just contract them away somehow because all of the strongly connected stuff doesn't matter anyways. Um, if my, my personal hope is that there is kind of a, a theory for uh, acyclic digraphs behind of this, like butterfly miners and directed trees and stuff like that kind of emerged as a, a structural theory for digraphs and directed circuits, but uh, they fail for acyclic digraphs. And this seems to be the, the dual operation that tries to understand the, the structure of these in context. Interesting. Are there any other questions? I have a trivia question. <laughs> Do you remember the name of the lead character, the lead male character in the Little Shop of Horrors? The the character should it be Seymour? It's Seymour, yeah. <laughs> this might not be coincidental. No, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, Sebastian. I'll end the recording there and we can have some informal discussion. All right.